So that was a very interesting uh, just experience, like feeling the anatomical markers and then like actually making my incision, taking my clamps, clamping my chest tube, putting it in, pushing it in, feeling the actual pop of the tissue and the chest tube going in. All of that stuff is like, it's amazing. You and I, when I do a lie, if I well, what's up you guys, it's Adana, welcome back to my channel. So for those of you who are new, go ahead and subscribe right now. Kind of browse on my channel, see if you like what you see, and if you do, definitely stay a while. Join this journey on um, with me. And you can also go to my Instagram at Adana the PA on Instagram and follow me on there as well because I like to post different things on Instagram that I do on YouTube. All right, now with that being said, this video is going to be about my experience, um, just a more detailed experience on my trauma rotation. So I recently did a video about just kind of summing up what I've done so far in my trauma rotation. And I have completed that rotation, but I saw that you all wanted more details on what exactly goes into the trauma rotation. So that's what this video is gonna be about. With respect to the types of trauma that I see, I was at a level two trauma hospital. So, I mean, if there's something that's really, really, really extremely serious, that we cannot handle at our level two trauma center, then we will send them to the level one trauma center. Um, that is a local trauma center in our area. But my particular hospital, we still got a lot of like your typical MVCs, which are your motor vehicle um, collisions, your MCCs, so your motorcycle collisions. We got a lot of falls from standing. It's usually like someone that is older and they had a stroke or you know um, like you know an MI or something that went into a cardiac arrest and then they were standing and they, they fell like so it's a lot of that kind of stuff or somebody didn't take their um, hypertension medicine and so now they're very hypotensive and then they fell and they struck their head and so we'll see a lot of bleeds um, we also saw just a lot of assaults uh, because of the area that I was in. You know, there are gang activities in that surrounding area. Um, and then just a lot of, um, you know, just nightlife. So drugs and prostitution and things of that nature where people get into fights and those fights can turn um, deadly. Uh, you know, that's obviously like the, <laughs> the end, end game. But, you know, they... they come in with very, very serious injuries. So when a patient comes through the trauma bay, you're either a level one, a level two, or level three trauma. So your level three traumas, there's a criteria for them all, but your level three traumas can usually be seen in the emergency department just by themselves. Although we are connected, we're technically two separate entities. So um, if you are a level three trauma, you can be seen in the emergency department. If you're a level two or level one, that is our, like, you know, our, because I was there so our area with respect to your level one traumas level one traumas are like your traumas that you think of where it's gunshot wounds stab wounds where there's gonna be a lot of blood so you're completely gowned so as soon as you hear a page come through and yes we still use pagers we're like carrying these pagers around and then we'll get the page and you'll hear it called over top head you know level one trauma ETA five minutes or ETA two minutes or or at level one trauma now so you'll get your page and you go immediately it doesn't matter where you're at I could be up in the call room logging patients or studying which I, I did often or if it's night time because I did 24-hour shifts I could be sleeping and then I get this page on my side so it's always important to have the pager nearby or on your person so that you can get the page feel the page and then be ready for the trauma so as you get that page you go down um, level one traumas you're completely gowned up you have your mask you have your caps on um, you have your full like gown and gloves and then you have your shoe booties on because you know it's bloody it's messy you don't want to really dirty your clothing and your shoes and stuff I mean I wouldn't want to but luckily there is a scrub machine in the hospital and as it is in most so you can always go and like throw in the soiled scrubs and then get a new pair but who wants to do that right so gown up protect yourself because you have no idea what's coming in you don't know if they have um, contagious illnesses that you know you don't necessarily want to um, contract so but you still have to 
go ahead and you know help these individuals. So the level one's gown completely up. Level two, I mean, you just have your gloves on, but you're ready with your stethoscope, your shears. Um, and as a student, uh, I was just kind of there. So I was there like in the mix, but not completely, completely in the mix. So when the trauma comes through, the EMS will bring them on the stretcher and then we have to pull the patient onto um, our beds. So I helped out with that. I would always be there ready um, to pull the patient over. If the patient has a C-spine sc collar on, which is to protect their C-spine, their cervical spine, um, so that they can't really turn their heads like that, then um, I was usually the one that was protecting C-spine because we go through a full, like very quick and dirty assessment of the patient. So, you know, we do the GCS scale, which is your Glasgow Coma Scale, to kind of tell you how aware the patient is which it deals with eye movement, um, their verbal, like are they talking to you or not, and then their motor skills. So are they moving all extremities? Are they not? Um, are they coming up to you like that? Are they only responding to pain? Those type of things. So that tells you kind of really like how sick is this patient really? And do they need to be innovated? Do we need to protect their airway? Um, the saying goes less than eight intubate so um definitely you you look at it and you're like okay well, does this person need to be intubated but i mean they could be not nine on the gcs or sometimes maybe even a 10 and depending on like if they're progressing really quickly like i had a patient that had severe facial edema and was progressing really quickly their gcs was a 10 but we had to intubate them because it was like no like there's their airway could be closing in any minute so things like that but we i'll protect the c-spine so we'll have to turn them so i hold the c-spine turn them they'll walk down their back to make sure that um, there's no pain there and immediately when you come in as well like I'm the one that's taking off all of your clothing so every trauma that comes through the trauma bay they are completely undressed um, only their underwear is left we'll put warm blankets on them and we'll also put a gown so that's what I'm doing I'm pulling off all of their clothing putting warm blankets putting on a gown next thing is we're asking them questions like hey, how are you doing? Uh, how did this happen? Um, what year is it? Who's the president? Uh, what's your name? All of those informations to see if they're alert and oriented times three or times four, um, depending on what they say. Um, we, we're looking at their eyes, like are their pupils equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation? Uh, if they're not, then we document that. We look in their ears, depending, you know, that's really important in traumas. Are there any, is there any ble um, bleeding or is there any cerebrospinal fluid coming out of their ears or their nasal cavities because um, the fluid will be a little bit less bloody, more um, clear or a mixture of blood and that clear fluid. And, you know, you would think, okay, so they have um, a fracture in one of their, the, the bones in their, in their skull because that's, like that's one of the ways that cerebral spinal fluid will leak out. So we look at those things. We also go and we'll talk out what are the different injuries that we see. So if there's a laceration to the um, anterior uh, forehead, we'll talk about that. Uh, if there is a stab wound or laceration to the chest, um, we'll listen to breath sounds. Are they equal? And my thing, so for me, I listen to breath sounds. Um, sometimes I, I'll do. I would do uh, like pedal pulses. Do I feel the pulses? Are they two plus or not? Um, I also took IVs, so I would start an IV on every last one of the patients after my second shift, which was a twelve-hour shift. But my first two shifts were twelve-hour shifts, and every shift after that, I did twenty-four hours. So after that. I always started IVs. I would take every opportunity that I can to do that because it's not necessarily a skill that I um, did a lot of in PA school and so I wanted to make sure that I was able to like keep up with that. So you start your IVs and you fill your, you get your blood and you start your IV and you fill your different containers to send out to the lab. So ab after we've gone through all of that, the patient's undressed blankets are on, IV is in, um, we do either normal saline or lactated ringers depending on if they have um, a brain injury or not, um, we would choose the different solutions. Usually it's a liter of that. 
and that's automatic. So after we've started that, gone through all of our systems, making sure, hey, do we hear breath sounds? If we don't hear breath sounds, then we put a chest tube in. And I was able to put in four chest tubes on my rotation there. Uh, and it was cool. It's cool seeing bedside chest tubes done because it's different than seeing the chest tube placed in my CT surgery rotation. So that was a very interesting uh, just experience, like feeling the anatomical markers and then like actually making my incision taking my clamps, clamping my chest tube, putting it in, pushing it in, feeling the actual pop of the tissue and the chest tube going in. All of that stuff is like, it's amazing. And it just made me appreciate even more. I'm like, dang, like, this is amazing. I cannot believe that I'm actually doing this. Like my hand is in someone's chest cavity. My finger is in there feeling around, making sure like I can break up adhesions and things of that nature. But that's also something that we do. If there's no, if there's breath sounds uh, are not equal and like the patient is desatting, then immediately we're putting in a chest tube. There are times when you may not necessarily see that initially. And that's when you go to our next step in the trauma I guess you can say um, organization. So after we've done all of that, the next thing is take them straight to CT scan. So depending on their injuries, we either pan scan them or we choose the specific areas that we're going to scan them at. You know, if they were in a motor vehicle accident and they have like abrasions to their leg, um, their hand is swelling, then we'll get like a hand, um, AP of the hand, AP lateral maybe, um, and also of their knee, their leg, whatever the case may be. And so we take them to the CT scan. I usually stay with them. And um, one thing I have to tell anybody that's going on a rotation or going on these types of rotations, always, always, always help your nurses out. Like that's, I, as a PA, I mean, obviously they'll have, they have other things to do. So they don't always go to CT, but after they've done putting in their orders, then they'll come over. But as a student, you know, there's nothing else that you have to do. So go ahead. You can watch your PA preceptor put in orders and stuff at a later time. Go help your nurse. Be like, is there anything that you need me to do? Push the bed. And that's what I always did. I'd push the bed, make sure that things were clean. I'd pick up after myself, put chucks down when I'm doing different procedures. But that's always, that's something important to remember. But we take them to CT scan, they get their CT scan then, and then we bring them back. And at that point, if there's a laceration, an open laceration, and they have blood on their face, that they need cleaned up, that's me. That's where I come in again. So I will clean them up. Um, I will do these lacerations. And I got to do so many laceration repairs, you guys. It was like, I am not, I'm not lacerationed out, but I was like lacerationed out. I was like, oh, absolutely. You need a laceration done? Oh, you need me to repair, um, you know, a finger laceration, a hand, forearm, anything. Just let me know because I wanted to take this opportunity to get as much experience as I could. So a lot of the times I use proline. Um, I had a gentleman that was assaulted and uh, he got cut and his, on. we saw it on his outer, the outer part of his cheek. But um, my preceptor was like, you know, you always go ahead and make sure that you, it doesn't go all the way through. So after you've numbed him up, take your hemostat and push it and see if you can see it on the other side or open his mouth and push, um, push it open to see if you can see a hole going through. And sure enough, the hole was like all the way through. So I had to use um, chromic in his mouth, which is uh, what you use in like mucous membrane areas and it's like absorbable. And then I use like a proline on the outer part of his face because it's nice and it's blue and it's fairly strong and you can see it so when it's time to go and remove those sutures because um, proline is not absorbable then you can just cut it and be fine so um and and you you have to learn those things uh you know in school we learn about the different kind of stitches that you throw but i didn't get that much education on okay absorbable versus non-absorbable um microfilament or polyfilament versus monofilament, why choose one over the other, that kind of thing. Obviously, you know absorbable and non-absorbable in areas that you, like, are inside of the body. You're not going to use a non-absorbable suture, you know, in the deep tissues of the body. You're going to use absorbable, but, so those things are kind of like common sense, but just trying to figure out, okay, am I going to use 
um, Vicryl or Monocryl or Proline or Chromic, like all of these different sutures, Ethicon, like what, Ethylene, like I don't know. So I had to look that up. And so it's important also to just kind of get um, an idea and have like Google on, on your like speed dial, I guess you can say, to look up this information. But after I would do that, after I'd suture up or clean up, whatever area needed to be clean, then my work was essentially done. I would um, document my procedure notes. Um, so you're not like, I would, I would help out. You're, as a PA student, you're not allowed to document, which is something I feel like probably should be changed because the med students are able to document the different procedures and things that they're doing. And if I'm the one that's doing the procedure, which a lot of the times, like I'm the one that's suit, doing a laceration repair or I'm the one that's removing the staples from you know a, a patient's skull like that they're, they're coming back or whatever the case may be or I'm giving discharge instructions then I should be able to like write the note because I did it so that's something that I think we should probably look into like getting changed somewhere in the future but um, I would also I would help out with my note, my procedure note, or I would type in the information and then they would look at it to make sure that they agreed with everything and it was accurate. And yeah, and then after that, uh, if another trauma came through, then I was on the other trauma. If not, uh, you kind of just take your time wherever you can to go get something to eat. Make sure you have a lot of water. Because um, a lot of times what will happen is you'll have like a trauma come through. Then you're spending like a good 30 or so minutes suturing because there might be like a lot of lacerations that you have to suture and clean up. And then another trauma comes in like immediately right after so you're just kind of in the swing of things and you don't realize how long you've been standing for and you're kind of tired and drawn out and like weary and so it's important to just stay hydrated stay fueled um, not overeat because a lot of it is overnight as well and what you see at night is very different than what you see during the day but all in all it was a great experience I loved it I hope you guys have a better understanding of exactly what I do um, I can just again go through the really really quick Big points which is immediately the trauma beeps uh, I got a beep page on my beeper um, a, a beeper yeah so I get a page coming through and then the trauma comes in immediately I take off all of their clothing we look to see if there are any overt fractures bones coming out of the skin um, bruises uh, if there are any step uh, or like kind of deformities going down the back um, or on their shoulders like you know for clavicle injuries those kind of things and then from that um, we will start the IV we'll put in the fluids and um, also another thing is you start kind of putting in order so if it's like a dirty injury like a motor vehicle accident and there's an open wound you know you're obviously gonna give them some type of antibiotic and also managing their pain so it's important to like understand okay am I giving this patient like flexoril and like Motrin and things of that nature these NSAIDs and muscle relaxants to help with that kind of pain or am I giving them like morphine or Dilaudid because um, you really don't want to like you know you always hear about these opioid uh, the opioid crisis and um, you know and things like when there's like a broken rim stuff those things are painful so like opioid crisis <laughs> kind of is out the window you're like no I'm going to give you some Dilaudid or Oxy for that pain. So it's important in understanding your patient and managing the type of pain that they have. Um, then we'll take them to the CT scan, see, have a report of exactly what is going on with the patient, and then you manage the patient, patient from there. They come back to the trauma bay, you manage them. If you have to suture up and, and fix these lacerations, you go ahead and do that. And from that, then you kind of just send them off to the floor or you discharge them home, depending on how healthy or sick they are. So um, it was exciting, you guys. I had a great time. This was a very detailed video on that, a little bit longer than my videos usually are, but I wanted to give you guys a feel of exactly what my day was like. Uh, anyways, if you have any other questions, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below. And um, if you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Follow me on Instagram at Adana the PA. And I can't wait to talk to you guys next time. Bye!